you have done so many things in the past 66 years. So I thought we would cover what <laughs> you are not. So you are not Jackie Chan. You are nope. not Robert Kiyosaki. <laughs> nope. And I saw in your Clubhouse bio, you actually stated, not the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, not a guru, not a thought leader, not a visionary, which is such an unusual thing for someone to put on a Clubhouse bio where everyone is like, oh, I've done a thousand one things before I turned 20. So right. why did you feel the need to put that in your bio? It would be an overstatement to say that I felt the need to do it. <laughs> I just wanted to be different because... I think there's a lot of bullshit on Clubhouse and I just want it to be the antithesis of someone who's trying to pretend to be an influencer, visionary, guru, whatever. I, I don't want any part of that. Completely understand. So what you are is a third generation Japanese American. And <laughs> yes, I read in your book that, you know, your great grandparents immigrated to Hawaii at the end of the Meiji period. And I wonder as a third gen, was Japanese values and culture something that was very prominent in your life growing up? Very prominent probably is a strong word, but certainly my parents taught me about education and humility and respect for elders. And of course, if they were alive, they might be disagreeing right now. But uh, also the concept of noblesse oblige, which is not Japanese, but the concept that you know, if you're fortunate, you owe a debt to society. So that definitely came from my parents. And what was it like growing up in Kalihi Valley? Yeah, it was a poor, semi-rough place. But you know what? I didn't know that we were poor. We weren't at the level of poverty of not enough food, no clothes, no books, you know, things like that. So, hell, I didn't know we were poor until I went to college and I saw what rich people really <laughs> <laughs> So you end up going to Kalihi Elementary and the yes. trajectory of your life changed because of the advice of your sixth grade teacher. Yes. Could you share yes. a bit about that story? Okay. So the public school system in Hawaii back then was challenging and not a lot of people went to college and continued on. And so my sixth grade teacher convinced my parents to take me out of the public school system, put me into the private school system because she thought I had too much potential. And luckily she convinced my parents, my parents made the sacrifices for me to do that. So that enabled me to go to a college prep school, which enabled me to go to Stanford. And that's where I met the person who brought me into Apple and the rest is history. So you could make the case that without that sixth grade teacher, uh, you probably wouldn't want me on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> What was it like in Iolani school? I believe Harrow Keebles had a tremendous impact on your life. Yes. You sure doing a lot of research. So Harold Keeble was my English teacher and he was by far the hardest teacher I ever had in my life. And so what I've come to figure out is that as you look back on your life, the teachers that were the hardest on you probably taught you the most and were the most valuable. And that same thing goes with bosses. And so I owe a great debt to Harold Keebles, the English teacher. Trudy Yakao was the other teacher in the Kalihi Elementary. And Steve Jobs, you know, three of the hardest people I ever worked for or studied under. And do you know at the time what you wanted to do? Why do you choose psychology? No, I still don't know what to do. Honestly, I kind of picked psychology because it was an easy major. That's the truth. So I tried pre-med for about one week and I had a great time at college. I, I loved college. What was Stanford like in the 1970s? Well, it's completely different. You know, first of all, being Japanese American in the 1970s, meant that you were considered a minority student that had to have special accommodations in terms of admission and you know all that other kind of stuff, as opposed to now where Asian Americans are suing because the standards are too high for them. Back then, it was very different. I don't think I would get into Stanford today, but back then I was considered an oppressed minority and I love Stanford. It was a great experience. It opened my eyes to what could be done in the world. So after Stanford, why did you choose law school for two weeks? Well, I, there's two parts to that question. Why did I choose law school? Because my parents really wanted me to go to law school. My father was a politician in Hawaii, and he had never even gone to college. So he was making laws, not having gone to college or gone to law school. So it was his dream for me. And I quit after two weeks because I just couldn't stand law school. I just hated it. And another kind of turning point in my life. Was it a difficult decision to decide to quit and then tell your parents? Yes. You have to understand, you know, back then, Asian Americans, education was everything. And I agree with that, actually. But still, 
to disappoint them after all it took to get into law school than to quit after two weeks. But at least I figured out I didn't want to be a lawyer quickly. <laughs> Sometimes it takes people decades to do that. So how do you decide to go from law school to the MBA? Well, I really loved business. I wanted to be in business. And back then, NBA was the sort of entry to going into business. Now, I don't think that's true today. But back then, uh, if you wanted to be in the management track, you had to have an MBA. That's not true today. Particularly, that's not true in tech. So during the MBA, you got your first job at a jewelry store run by a small uh, Jewish family. A jewelry manufacturer. And I worked there part-time because I needed money. And then I worked there after I graduated and was in sales and marketing. So I went from jewelry to high tech. And I will tell you that that's not a logical path, but it was a very, very good path because in the jewelry business, I had to learn how to sell. And evangelism is a form of sales. You've described sales as something of a hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is quite an yeah. unusual equivalent. Why would you describe it that well, way? Today, so much of sales is about SEO and A-B testing. You know, does the blue link work better than the red link? And what size font and what font works best on your homepage? None of that was true back then. And back then it was you call on the jewelry retailer and you try to get an order out of them. It was very different. It was personal selling in person. We sold to Tiffany and Cartier and you know, all the fine jewelry stores, and they would just pound on you. I mean, I learned how to get pounded on. So. <laughs> and what about Marty Gruber? I believe he really yes. taught you a lot. What was he like? Well, Rick? Marty Gruber was the CEO of the jewelry firm, and you know, he really embraced and helped me learn how to sell. And uh, if it wasn't for him, maybe I wouldn't be so evangelistic. But, you know, I, I owe a debt to him for helping me learn how to sell. So while you were doing jewelry, you were also working at a software company, Edgeware Services as director of marketing. Yeah, I left the jewelry business to go into Edgeware because I fell in love with technology. I got an Apple II, I think, and I fell in love with technology. And I just wanted to be in the tech business, not in the jewelry business. And I was rejected by everybody, except I finally found this small educational software company out in San Fernando Valley. And they only hired me because the only sales and marketing exec there got into a car accident. So they literally needed somebody back then. If it weren't for that car accident, I might not have gotten into the software business. So did that experience affirm your love for software? Yes, it affirmed my love for just anything tech. And I, I wasn't there very long when that company was bought by a large company out of Atlanta. And I just did not want to go to Atlanta. And at the same time, my friend from Stanford, Mike Boych, recruited me into Apple. And that's why I got into Apple. Wasn't Mike Boych the person who introduced you to Apple too? Yes. He introduced me to Apple II, got me into Macintosh, all that. So yeah, the thing, the lesson there is that nepotism is a good thing. <laughs> if it wasn't for nepotism, seriously, if it wasn't for nepotism, I would not have gotten into Apple. There's no way. There's no yeah. way I would have gotten in through the front door. You wrote in your book, Wise Guy, that Steve Jobs told Mike, you can hire a guy, but you're betting your job on him. Yes, Which yes. Is, so that, that's a ringing endorsement, huh? That's literally what he said. Yeah. And I wonder what was it that Mike saw that he was willing to put his career on the line for you? Well, maybe he didn't know that that was going to be the choice when he recruited me. <laughs> that happened at the end. Well, you know, we had known each other for four years by then. So you know, when you're young and you're just out of college, you don't know what the hell you're doing. So sometimes you get lucky. And what was it like going to Apple? It was just pinch me. I mean, it was like going to Disneyland every day and getting paid for it. This was the best and the brightest, the leading edge of Silicon Valley, taking on IBM, you know, working for the one and only Steve Jobs. I mean, how much better could it get than that? And coming from the jewelry business, fundamentally from Hawaii, without a computer science degree, et cetera, et cetera. This is like fairy tale land. So Apple back then was the place that, everyone wanted to get to. I don't know about everyone, but because Apple has gotten more and more popular, obviously, but you would not be embarrassed by going to work for Apple. That's for sure. <laughs> I found it so interesting that you would describe it as Disneyland, as you just said, but you've also <laughs> described it as a place where he has the largest collection of egomaniacs in history. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, those two things are not necessarily uh, in conflict, but yeah, we had a lot of strong egos, but you had to have a strong ego to work for Steve. 
And what was Apple like that in terms of division? I think there was Apple II peripheral division and the Mac division. And yeah, you were in um, the Mac division, so you got special yes. treatment. Yeah, but because we work for the co-founder. But the truth is that the Apple II division was paying for the bills because Macintosh was not yet finished. So it, with hindsight, it was unfair to the Apple II division because they were making all the money, we were spending all the money, and yet we considered them, you know, sort of down an order in the pecking order. So yeah, but that was just one indication of the degree of arrogance we had in our division. I think there was a joke, wasn't it? How many guys from Mac it took to screw on a light bulb? A light bulb, <laughs> yes. And the answer is one, because the universe revolves around you. Yes. And obviously, we need to talk about Steve Jobs. And he expected excellence from everyone every day or you get fired. And I wonder what it was like working in an environment where someone was so demanding. Well, you know, I mean, compared to now, you would say it's very traumatic, but it was so exciting and protecting the employees in, in terms of legally and just sort of psychologically was not what it is today. <laughs> it was a different time. Okay. But I can't tell you that I would like to erase that from my past or that I regret working there. I mean, it was a great time. It, sometimes you just look back and it was like the hardest times are the best times. And that's true of the Macintosh division. Apple didn't have the most press friendly relationship, but you were out there meeting everyone. Well, yeah, I mean, Apple, you know, was such a darling of Silicon Valley that everybody wanted time with the Apple executives. Now, I was obviously not at the top of the pyramid, but Whenever people ask me, I help them because, I don't know, that's just in my DNA. And with hindsight, it was very fortunate because many of those people who were entry-level journalists back then, they are now very powerful journalists or after a few years were very powerful. So this is before social media. So there's only two ways to get the word out, which is PR and advertising and <laughs> advertising is expensive. So you end up resigning for the first time in 1987 to found this Macintosh database company called ACS, a day after your promotion, what was yes. it about this company that had you convinced? Well, there was several things. So one is it pissed me off that another database company held a gun to Apple's head and said, you cannot publish this because it would compete with them. So that offended me morally. And then you know, I had listened to my own hype about the great opportunities in Macintosh software. And so you know, it was just time to go and start your own company. I had been there about four years by then. It's too bad if I had stayed that time or the next time, I'd be much richer. <laughs> <laughs> Did the reality meet the hype that you were generating? I would say that company was kind of a, a single or a double, but it certainly wasn't a home run. So probably just financially, no, no, it wasn't that big a deal. But, you know, that's how it goes in entrepreneurship. So you did a lot of things outside. You were writing a book, you were speaking, consulting. Came this back is to post Apple, yes. <laughs> post Apple, I was speaking and consulting and writing and all that stuff, yes. Do you feel like you had found what you wanted to do at the time? Well, at any given moment, I always feel like I found what I wanted to do, but uh, I just find different things later. So I'm 66 and right now I'm chief evangelist of Canva and I'm a podcaster and I just love both those things. And so, you know, right now, yeah, but who knows? I will never work for another company. That's for sure, though. <laughs> And I wonder, you know, the second time you went back to Apple, why did you decide to do that? Because it was a time when Apple, many thought it was going to die. Yes. I loved Apple and I wanted to ensure the success of Macintosh. They made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I mean, was, all the things just sort of aligned. It was a great job. I, I was an Apple fellow and the chief evangelist of Apple. And knock on wood, very fortunate for me that Apple has become even more successful. So it's very good. If you go to my LinkedIn profile and it says former chief evangelist of Apple, people take that very seriously. So it's a good thing Apple succeeded after that because otherwise they'd say chief evangelist of what? Who's that? What is that company? So what is it like the day-to-day -day job of an evangelist looks like? I think for most people, they'll look at it and go, I've never heard of this title before. What does it yeah. mean? Well, there was Jesus before me. Evangelism comes from Greek words that means bringing the good news. So what an evangelist does is bring the good news. I brought the good news of Macintosh, how we would make people more creative and productive. I am bringing the good news of Canva, how Canva makes everybody a better communicator because it has democratized design. So everybody can make beautiful designs with Canva. And so that second time when you were at Apple, I believe that evangelist was something that yeah. was prominent. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, gosh, so many people are probably not familiar with this term anymore. It was a list server. The way a list server works is people subscribe to an email list. So it's opt in. And then every day, I think we would send out an email about good news about Macintosh. So, you know, new products, new services, and the new products and services of companies, because my perception was that there was so much bad news about Apple. If you just read the newspapers and magazines, you would think everything was bad. So I decided to create my own channel called Evangelist and only put out good news. Today, you know, every influencer is 25 million, but believe it or not, back then, that was huge. There were not many lists with 44,000 people on it and almost by definition, all true believers in Macintosh. And so why do you decide to leave Apple again for the second? To start another company. Yeah, to start <laughs> another company. There's a pattern here, yeah. So in the meanwhile, you also started writing books. You've written 15 yes. so far. And some yes. might say you've written 15 different books or 15 books on the same thing. You, you could say that, yes. I mean, why do you think people say that? I don't know, because I've covered the topic of entrepreneurship, marketing, evangelism, social media, kind of over and over, because it is a component of many of the topics that I cover. So it's a fine line, you know, so on the one hand, you're going to be accused of just repeating yourself. On the other hand, if you're not consistent, you can't say in one book that social media is important. And then the next book say it's not important, right? So you can't do that either. So that's the tricky thing <laughs> about when you write 15 books, you have to maintain consistency, but not look like you're simply copying and pasting the old stuff. And so the big thing that you're doing right now is Canva. And yes. I would love to know how you first heard about Canva and got involved with them. Actually, it was someone who worked with me named Pig Fitzpatrick. So she was creating the graphics with Canva for Twitter. And Canva noticed that I was using Canva. So they tweeted me and I responded and I asked Peg if I should help them. And she said yes. And the rest is history. So it was because of Peg Fitzpatrick, really, that Canva found me. And then you responded and they said, oh, we're going to be in the States and let's meet up. Yep. So what was that, that conversation like? The conversation was amazing. It was, you know, this is what we do. This is our vision. This is how we're going to empower people. And I loved it. I love democratizing stuff to taking you know, something that only a Photoshop expert with expensive software and training could do. And now anyone could do it. Just like before with Macintosh, I love taking it out of the hands of MIS and IT departments. And now anyone can use a computer by themselves. So I'm big into democratizing things. And what was Canva like then? Because I use Canva a lot and it's changed over time. Now you can use video. It's just so powerful. Yeah. But you joined Canva when they were only two years old. So what was it like then? It was, there were days when we would get 500 new signups and we'd be just celebrating. And now we get tens of thousands of new signups every day. I've been there about seven years. It's been quite a ride. <laughs> I believe your job was to get some of the key hires for them. So one of my chief roles was that as Canva grew, they needed to get the A-list talent. And because I'm fairly well known in high tech, when it came to closing candidates, I often made the call because this may sound a little arrogant, but you know, when a candidate gets a call and it's Guy Kawasaki who he's heard of, or she's heard of or read or something that helps close the candidate to decide to go to Canva, honestly. I mean, you had a 70% success rate, so that's really <laughs> high. Well, I mean, I, you know, it's also the fact that I was recruiting for something very good. You don't get 70% success rate re recruiting for a crappy company, trust me. And what about the culture at Canva? I believe in your interview with Melanie, you say that they were all relentlessly pursuing perfection. Yes, like Toyota. Yeah, I've never worked with a group of people who more relentlessly pursue perfection in everything they do. So there are companies that are engineering driven. There are companies that are operations driven. There are companies that are manufacturing driven, cost driven. But Canva, every part of the company wants to just do the greatest job they can. I've never worked with people like that. It's really unusual. How do they do it? I don't know. It's magic. They got pixie dust in, <laughs> in the water in Sydney. And I, I don't know. It's magic. I've never seen it happen. You know, quite frankly, you just have to give credit to the three founders. It's Cameron and Cliff and Melanie. Do you think that you had anything to do with the way that the teams are set up? The way they're set up? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, you know, my focus was always external. 
It was always about building brand awareness, credibility, customer acquisition. I wasn't managing anybody inside. Are there specific things that you always use to build that kind of brand awareness? Because clearly you are fantastic at building your own brand (laughs) and that you translate that to the companies. Well, but you know what? Let me tell you something. So I don't think about quote unquote building my brand. So I, I think that the way a person builds his or her brand is to affiliate or create something great. In my case, I've been lucky. I've been affiliated with Macintosh and affiliated with Canva. So I don't wake up in the morning thinking, how can I increase my brand awareness, my thought leadership, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that Elon Musk or Steve Jobs gets up in the morning thinking about that too, right? So Steve Jobs used to get up in the morning thinking how to make the best computer, how to make the best iPhone, iPod, iPad, retail experience. And if you do that, then guess what? People have respect for you and consider you a visionary thought leader, you know, amazing person. So I would be astounded if he ever gave much thought to positioning himself as a thought leader. Same thing with Elon Musk. Same thing with Richard Branson. I don't think they care about that kind of stuff. Becoming the leaders and the the famous people that they are is a consequence of the competence that they have. It's not something that they decided to market. Speaking of Richard Branson, you had a meeting with him where he got on his knees and convinced you to join Virgin. Yeah, to fly on Virgin. Yeah, he polished my shoes. I've never seen anything like that. That's when I told him I was a United Airlines Global Services. So it's the highest category of United customer. And I was that. And then he asked me if I flew Virgin. I said no. And he got on his knees and started polishing my shoes. (laughs) That's amazing. And so now you are doing a podcast of your own called Remarkable People. Yes. Which I love. How did you get started in podcasting? I got started in podcasting. There's two stories. One is I figured out that I had access to a lot of remarkable people and I could create a podcast where I could help people learn how to be remarkable by listening to other remarkable people. So, you know, I had that ability and good fortune. Another version of the story is that I was on a book tour and I asked these business podcasters, you know, about their business model. And they told me their business model and their business model is so much better than an author's business model. I said, you know, why am I killing myself writing books. I should just become a podcaster. And that's the other side of that decision. The name of the podcast, Remarkable People, I think it went through several iterations. It went through many iterations. At the time I was going around talking about my book, Wise Guy. So I thought about naming it Wise Guy. The problem with naming it Wise Guy is that that implies that it's all guy's wisdom and it's not guy's wisdom. In fact, it's very little of guy's wisdom. Mostly it's my guest's wisdom. And so Wise Guy did not really work And then we thought, okay, so how about, you know, the wisdom of remarkable people, but that just is too long and not memorable. So yeah, it just became remarkable people. And believe it or not, I bought that domain remarkablepeople.com for a couple thousand bucks and we're off. You were going to call it duh as well, which I thought was I was. I seriously consider calling it duh, D-U-H. Like, you know, duh, this is why Jane Goodall is so great or duh, this is what she learned. But people talk me out of that. So speaking of Jane Goodall, she was your first guest on 4th yes. December 2019. And you have an interesting story of how you got her onto the podcast. Yeah, it's a lesson in life because someone in Palo Alto who ran the TEDx knew of me. I didn't know this person personally. She just knew who I was. And so when she got Jane Goodall, she invited me to be the interviewer of Jane Goodall. And of course, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Although in my case, it's now four times in my lifetime. But at that time, it was the first time in my lifetime. And of course, I jumped at that. And that's how Jane and I became friends. Amazing. And once you launched Remarkable People, did it take off the way that you thought it would? No, no. I I thought that I would have, you know, millions of subscribers by now. And I don't. I have tens of thousands. So I freely admit I have not yet figured out how to get millions of subscribers, but I am not alone. (laughs) (laughs) Not There's not a lot of people who have figured out how to get millions of subscribers to a podcast. Some of it may just be that you're there early, but I will tell you that there is no doubt in my mind that my podcast, my guest list and the quality of my interview is as good as anybody in podcasting. And I agree. You can dispute that. I can thank you for agreeing. So it's not because of the quality of the podcast. It may be my marketing, but if I had to choose between lousy marketing and a great podcast or great marketing and a lousy podcast, guess which one I would choose. So yeah, I'll deal with it. So what is your schedule? Because I understand that that is the thing that you're doing apart from surfing. 
Well, yeah. So I just got finished surfing. So, you know, basically I wake up at 6.30 or 7. I drink a cup of coffee. I eat a banana and peanut butter sandwich. I just start working on email and podcasting and social media. I go surfing, eat lunch, go back to work, eat dinner, go back to work. And I also do a lot of guest appearances like this where I'm on somebody else's podcast because this is good for the marketing of remarkable people. And you said before to Jennifer Ecker that podcasting has really added meaning into your life and you were born to be a podcaster. I am. I love the preparation. I love the interview. I love the editing. And mm -hmm. I hope that it shows in the podcast. It's just so delightful to be able to get to so many famous, successful people. Although not everybody on my podcast is famous. You have to be remarkable. You know, my my podcast is called Remarkable People, not Famous People or not Rich People. It's called Remarkable People. So you can be remarkable and not rich and not famous. And I just enjoy discovering these gems. So what is that criteria for remarkable? Because I heard even in Clapout, some people will pitch themselves to you and be like, I'm remarkable, let me on. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, a very good rule of thumb is very few people who pitch themselves as remarkable are remarkable. Because, I mean, if you're Jane Goodall, Jane Goodall doesn't call you up saying, I'm Jane Goodall, I'm remarkable. Let me tell you why, okay? So that eliminates 90% of the people right there who asked to be on the podcast. In fact, of the people who asked to be on the podcast, I think only one has ever been on it. Uh, a lot of times, uh, book publicists ask me, and typically a book publicist who's working with a top-notch author, that author is remarkable. So that just works out to our mutual benefit. They want exposure for their new book, and I need somebody on my podcast, so... And have you seen any impact that your podcasting has had on society? That's an interesting question. I can't tell you that I can prove that the world is a better place or that you know, climate change has stopped. No, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> but I have constant feedback about how the podcast has informed and inspired people. And so the next thing I'll love to talk about before we wrap up is Clubhouse. So you yes. are a very frequent user on Clubhouse. I've loved yes. your sessions. How did you, you first get on Clubhouse? You know, people have been telling me for months to get on Clubhouse. And I just kept saying, you know, I don't need another social media platform. I don't understand. And, you know, it was supposed to be like this hot thing about Silicon Valley VCs. That doesn't move my pulse you know, to get the next hot thing with Silicon Valley VCs. And then finally, Jeremiah Aoyang just twisted my arm into doing it. I started listening to a few. And then I decided, well, you never know. What if this is really successful? It's a land grab. You ought to start now because it's going to be too late once it's established. And so my activity on Clubhouse is largely defensive in the sense that I want to be there and I want to have critical mass just in case it succeeds. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. That's wasted effort, but who knows? The worst case would be if it does succeed and I got to start when it's too late. That I don't want to do. It's very hard to add followers and awareness on a social media platform after it's succeeded. You got to start before it succeeds. But I think that's one of the things, right? Because there are always new platforms coming up and you have to decide which platform is deserving of my time to invest in this early stage. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not even on TikTok really. So yeah, you know, I have finite hours in the day and interests. So yeah. So you run AMA rooms and you were recently in Guy Rest, how I built this room. And I've noticed in your AMA rooms, especially, you always bring females up and use your special Guy Kawasaki algorithm <laughs> of the hardest to pronounce names. Yes. How did that come about? Well, I interviewed someone, this episode appeared this week, and he was the chief of staff for Jeff Bezos. He was right. telling me stories about the inside of Amazon. And one story was the department had very poor gender diversity. And so they came up with a clever idea, which is that at Amazon, you know, people get the resume and then they decide to call the initial screening call. And not everybody gets the initial screening call. It's based on your resume and cover letter. So this department, in order to increase gender diversity, called every woman. And that obviously increased the pipeline of women for that department. And so I heard that story and I said, you know, guy, that is a very clever idea. So what you should do is on Clubhouse, you should only call on women. And so when I start an AMA in Clubhouse, I tell people, listen, I think women's voices have been suppressed for too long. So in my little speck of the universe, I'm going to do what I can to reverse that. So I only invite women. If you're a man, you will not be asked on stage and I will not give you the mic. And so be it. Have you gotten any backlash for this? No, not really. And, you know, if I do get backlash, and someday I might, I would simply say to them that, listen, you know, now you know how a woman feels. Your voice can't be heard. Well, tough shit. So that's how it is. And what do you think Clubhouse needs to do to breach that gambiting 
say, as the early adopters and mainstream? Well, I think right now Clubhouse is a little too much of marketers talking to other marketers. So I think it's too much marketers talking to marketers and we need like chess clubs and cooking clubs and hiking and I don't know, transgender and, you know, whatever. We need a, like a myriad of tiny little clubs and rooms representing all the kinds of interests around the world. And it's not just marketers talking to other marketers about how to get rich quick because there's too much of that on Clubhouse right now. That comes back to my profile, you know, why I say I don't know how to get rich quick and I'm not a thought leader, guru or visionary. And so one of the things that questions I've noticed you get quite often is, will Canva ever host its own Clubhouse group? I hope so. I mean, I think it's necessary and a good bet because I think that Canva has tens of millions of monthly active users. So I think a Canva Clubhouse would be quite popular and it would fit in with the kind of people who use Canva. Uh, Of course, I can't get a club for myself or Canva. They don't answer my email. So what can I do? Another thing I've noticed is that you give your email so freely all the time in your email rooms is in your book. And I wonder why that is the case. Some people are so protective of it, but you just say it out all the time. You know, I say it out all the time. I even put my cell phone in my email signature. So my cell phone's out there all the time. And I can tell you, hardly anybody calls and hardly anybody writes. So in any given clubhouse session, there's hundreds of people. And I say, okay, my email is Guy Kawasaki at Gmail. And maybe two or three people write into me. So they self-select. Now, it's true that I'm a 66-year-old man. I'm not some you know, 19-year-old hot woman. So that might have something to do with it, but it's never been a problem for me. Very maybe it's because I've never been hot. And I think the upside of actually making contact with me easy far exceeds the downside of, you know, so I'll get some weird email and pitches and stuff. I just reject those. So it's not that hard. So I'd love to read that with this question, which is I have read your books, been on your clubhouse rooms, you know, your talks. And I've noticed that you have shared your story so many times, but every time you've managed to keep it so fresh. And so like you're saying it for the first time. And I'm just amazed because I'll read your books and go, oh, he just said that in clubhouse so many times. How yeah, do you- at least I'm consistent, right? <laughs> How do you keep it so fresh? Because I would imagine after so long, you'd be like... Know. Maybe I'm just full of shit. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, that's just what I do, Ling. That's just what I do. Well, thank you so much, Guy. You're very your welcome. I normally love to end all my interviews with these questions. So for the first one, okay. it's this. Have you found your what? Uh, about six times, yeah. Which is kind of an answer in and of itself. There's many times I thought I found my what... And then I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? The legacy is happy kids and the thought that my writing, speaking, investing and advising and podcasting and clubhousing has empowered people. And what do you think are the most important qualities a successful person should have? Grit, the ability and desire to work hard trumps everything. Every Angela Duckworth's book. Yes, yes. And where can people go to connect with you and support everything that you're doing? Well, I would like them to listen to my podcast because I think my podcast can literally change their lives. And that's at remarkablepeople.com. I'm on all the social media platforms. Well, not all, but, you know, I'm Guy Kawasaki on LinkedIn, Guy Kawasaki on Instagram, Guy on Facebook, which is, think about that. How many people have a three-letter Facebook name? And then my email is Guy Kawasaki at Gmail.